It is thoroughly a thrill and a privilege to get to introduce to you tonight uh, Dr. Bruce Lipton for an evening I assure you you will remember from now on. And without another word, I ask you to warmly welcome Bruce Lipton. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a great opportunity, a wonderful opportunity to speak here. Uh, I want to thank Doug and the, all the members of the Caring Center and the video crew for this uh, wonderful chance because I have the great privilege of presenting to information tonight that hasn't really been put out in the public a lot. And it stems from my work as a research scientist. Basically, my work was involved with cloning human muscle cells. I was working with dystrophic patients and taking out human cells and trying to understand what the control mechanisms were that were providing for the pathological expression of the cell. And I was doing this while teaching in medical school, as Doug said. The interesting thing was this. After my years of research, I started to recognize something that some of our current beliefs and our, our truths about medicine are actually not very correct at all that there's a revolution going on in the healthcare uh, area, but it's at the leading edge of research. And where I was working at that end, I found that it really should come down to the people. It's really more important for you to understand because the information I'm going to present tonight is very, very self-empowering information because it really reveals that we've had some very well, assumptions, and I'm going to list them for you. And you know the definition of assume uh, that uh, that we have been we've really been messed up by some some ideas that are not absolutely correct. And now, if I try to correct them and present them to you with an understanding of how biology works, which is relatively simple because nature is simple in how she does everything. Once I explain this, and you really start to see how powerful you have been, but how limited you have been because of alterations in our belief about how powerful we've been. That we've held some very important beliefs that have been transmitted from science to the public. And the issue about that is in converting the scientific information into public words, a lot of the meaning has been shifted around and it's not exactly the truth. So there's a, a thing that you've heard about genetic determinism, for example, that you are controlled by genes. And during the first hour of this presentation tonight, what I really want to show you is the, the, other, the other truth, that there is a truth that's, that says that, in fact, that you're not controlled by genes. You're actually controlled by your perceptions of the environment. And as we'll talk about, perceptions mean beliefs. And the significance about this is that when we talk about genes, and um, we talk about genetic uh, illnesses or genetic predispositions, let me give you an important factoid first. Indeed, there are things called genetic defects. And they affect about 5% of the population. Well, what I'm really trying to address is this. It's the 95% of the population that got here with wonderful genes and were capable in all ways being biologically sound, and yet end up uh, expressing illnesses and cancers and early death and cardiovascular diseases. And there's a tendency, of course, for us to put this emphasis and onus on the genes. But it turns out, no, it really turns out that it's how the genes are selected and rewritten by our belief systems. I was working on cloning these cells, and what I started to recognize was that because part of my experiment was uh, destroying the DNA and watching the behavior of the cell. And the, and the surprising part is, is that you can destroy all the DNA and the cell still has a life and it still has behavior. And the belief is if DNA is controlling the cell, then what's controlling the cell after all the DNA is gone? Well, this is what led me to an understanding of the real brain of the cell, which is what the subject of this movie is going to be about, ultimately. And then basically what I started to recognize was that uh, I got really excited about it because it's like, oh my god, this is a whole new understanding of science at the time. And uh, I started to go out and lecture about it. And it was real exciting because uh, the conventional people, my colleagues and peers, all understood it, but they were still wary of it because we've invested so much money in the belief of genes and drugs that it was real hard for them to, to shift midstream and start to look at other alternative beliefs. And so the significance about it was this, is that for the first two years, I was all excited going out, talking to people, and telling them about, God, this is a great understanding. If you really understand this stuff, how powerful it is on your life and how you can change your life. And then I started recognizing people look at me and go, you know, Bruce, this is a great story, but your life doesn't look so great to me. And I realized the truth, and this was the important part about it, was we always put, we think that if we just take this academic information in our head, then all of a sudden our lives are going to change. It's sort of like, a, it's like an academic pill. If I take the pill, I'm going to be better. And I realized at some point, especially when I almost heard myself say to these people, I said, well, do as I say, not as I do. 
And I realized at some point, well, how can I be talking about this great stuff and yet not applying it to my life? And that's when I realized at some point I said, okay, let's not talk about this anymore until you go out and actually try to live that way. So the beautiful part about it is now, 15 years into this, it only took me a few months to start to recognize the change, but here's the simple reality. I left a world that if I was going to live in it and give it a title, I would have called it maybe purgatory at best. And now I find myself living in heaven on a day-by-day -day basis to recognize this, that we have a great influence over the unfoldment of our lives, but we have never really been given clarification of how that influences our lives. And so the significance of this is real in that I can provide you with this information. You can walk away with the information, but there's a point where actually you have to start participating in it like I had to do it and start to incorporate it into our lifestyle because we can change belief. What's unusual about these women? And what's unusual about these women are their ages. And if you check out the ages of these women, Dorothy at 75 years old is dancing every night in the Palm Springs Follies. The minimum age to get in the Follies is 55 years of age. The significance about these women is, of course, first of all, you notice the vitality that they have. You'll also probably recognize at some point that they don't get affected by the same things that other people experience as they get older. And so what is the issue that gives them this vitality? This is the basic question. Our conventional understanding is that genes provide for this. So all of us hear all the time in newspaper articles, on television and media, about genes controlling this and genes controlling that. And the relevance is that we have come to believe a concept called genetic determinism. The significance of genetic determinism is this. It is a belief that says that at the moment of conception, when the sperm and egg came together, the genes were selected for your life, and that the rest of your life unfolds from the reading of these genes. Well, there's a problem with that. And the problem with it is this. If it is true, then we become victims of our heredity, don't we? What do, how can we get out of the genes? They're in, built into us. We can't get out of it. And then also something else happens. We become irresponsible. The reason is this. If the genes are making me do these things and I can't change my genes, then what is it that I can do with my life except make sure I probably get the proper medication to make me feel better through the process? And the issue comes down to this point, that this assumption is an assumption, <laughs> that it's not true that genes do not control who you are. And yet, I will have to go through this by going through the fact that there are three assumptions that science is based on that are totally wrong at this time. And these three assumptions include assumption number one. This is an assumption that says that biological processes employ Newtonian mechanics. What does that mean? It means this. According to the Newtonian world, the Newtonian vision, the universe is a machine that it's made out of physical parts, and that if you understand how the physical parts interact, you can understand everything about the machine, and that there's no room for energy in there, it's only physical parts. So the relevance is this, by the belief in Newtonian physics, medicine does not entertain the notion that energy is involved in the healing process. Of course, Newtonian physics is out of date now by 75 years, because we entered the quantum era in 1925, The second assumption is what I'm going to spend most of the talk on for the first part. The second assumption is based on absolute chemical truth that genes cannot control biological expression for a very simple reason. Genes can't turn themselves on and they can't turn themselves off. So the genes aren't controlling themselves. They can't control In evolution provided for the existence of the bio biosphere as we see it. This again is another control anything else either and I'll explain where the control comes from and third the assumption that Darwin mistake in our assumption that in fact that uh, it is not a Darwinian process that got us here that's more of a what we call a Lamarckian process and the relevance of that is that organisms always match their environment and as the environments change the organisms change to adapt to those environments well what does that mean about yourself what environments are you living in and what are your belief systems they become very important because what we find now is that your genes will adapt to your beliefs and this becomes a very very critical part uh, part of our understanding about life here. So I 
want to start off with the original mission statement of science. And that was based on a belief before 1600s that God and spirit infused the physical world. And so they had a mission statement. There were scientists before the 1600s, and this was their mission statement. To gain an understanding of the natural order so that we can live in harmony with it. And that was and yet medicine is still stuck in the biological uh, Newtonian phase. And I'm going to talk about this in the second half of the talk. A nice, beautiful concept that by studying in nature, if we see how it all fits together and all the pieces fit together, then maybe we would be able to fit together better in that picture and survive in, in a much better way than we were doing it. So science's effort was to understand the mechanisms of the universe in regard to the spiritual nature of it. However, around 1600 is when the modern scientific revolution occurred. People like Descartes. People like Isaac Newton got involved, and they looked at the universe and said, you know, I, it, it, there might be a God out there, but we don't need God to explain this because it works like a clockwork mechanism. And that's where Newton got involved, and he, with his mathematics, was able to map out the movements of the planets and the sun. And obviously then he said, look, it's a machine. I can predict everything about it. Well, that then relate to biology, because when we got to biology, we began to look at the body not from an outside spiritual influence, but we started to look inside the body because we said the body is a machine. And it's just like the universe. And if we understand the machine, we can fix and adjust the machine. So science took a different approach. Rather than trying to live in harmony with life, this is the mission statement that current modern science is involved with, to obtain knowledge that can be used to dominate and control nature. The point is, at least at the, at the good concept of it is, well, if you got here and you had something defective or you were unhealthy or you were getting disease, then if we could control your body, we can control your health and the disease, and therefore we could provide you with health. So basically, you have to dominate and control nature to do this. So the issue is, I mean, first of all, just think of that silly nature that humans are going to control nature. Well, I mean, we always think big, and obviously that's one of the thoughts. And the reality is then what to control nature is we have to look at the human cell. Here's an important part that I learned from my research on cells and what I used to teach medical students. And that's a very interesting point. You are made out of anywhere from 50 to 70 trillion cells in your body. You're actually a community of cells. I used to clone people's cells, take them out and put them in a culture dish. And sometimes, in fact, many times the cells grew better in the culture dish than they grew in the individual, meaning that the environment was altering the reflection of the cells. Well, here's the point that I was teaching, and it's an important point for you to understand. With all this magnificent machinery that we call the human body, there is no new function that's present in your human body that's not already present in every single cell. You have a digestive system, a respiratory system, an excretory system, a nervous system. So does the cell. And the relevance of that is, is that by taking the cell apart, we hope to find the nervous system for the simple reason is this. In order to pursue the mission statement of science is what? To control? Well, then we have to look at the organ that controls, and that is the brain and the nervous system. Well, we study the human, but it gets too complex. That's why if we study the cell, it's a lot easier. And so most of the advances in medical science are actually work from studying individual cells because the function of the cell and the life of the cell is almost identical to us. But how do we understand how do we attack this problem? How do we go and investigate cells? Well, we use science. The science that we use is Newtonian mechanisms. Remember I said currently biology uses Newtonian mechanisms. Well, there are three aspects of Newtonian mechanisms that are very important. Number one, the belief in materialism. The fact is this, according to Newtonian mechanics, Everything that's worth studying is physical because they don't believe that anything else is out there besides the physical wor the world. The, it's just parts. So all that matters is matter. So in looking at a body, you look at the parts of the body. Number two, bodies are complex things. And, and there's a way of understanding complex things because if you look back at the body, you say, how can something work? Look how complex it is. And the answer is, there's an approach in Newtonian mechanics called reductionism. And reductionism is this concept, that if something is complicated, you take it apart and you study the individual pieces. And when you study the pieces, you can assemble them in an order and then understand how they work. And therefore, you understand how complex things work. The analogy that's often used is the analogy of a watch. If I found this watch and I didn't know how it worked, what would I do? And the answer is I would take it apart. And once I take it apart, I start to find that gear A turns gear B turns gear C. And then I start to create a flow chart. A goes to B goes to C to D, etc. And here's the point. If you bring me your watch and it's not working right, then what would I do? I would take it apart, 
look at all the parts, A, B, C, and D, and if there's a part that's not right or not working right, I can take that part out and replace it with a new part. Well, the relevance is, this is your body, and we can take it apart and look at the pieces, and if your body's not working right, then what will we do? We'll take it apart and put new parts in. And if we put new parts in, then we can control the outcome, and that's called determinism. That's the third leg of the Newtonian philosophy. The fact is this, if I know how the parts work, then conceivably if I make new parts, I can put it into the machine and then I can control the machine by altering the parts. And so basically by determinism we mean that you come in sick and I say which part's wrong, I give you a drug, stick it in your body and all of a sudden you feel all, fed, all better again because we can predict the outcome through a process called determinism. And that leads us to this understanding, this is from Judy Olawson's book called Mother's Little Helpers. Uh, this, this picture here shows uh, the Valium bottle sitting right there, the proverbial mother's little helper, and the relevance about it is this. As you notice, every 15 minutes on television, there's ads from the drug companies. And not only are they telling you now that they can fix parts of you, arthritis, pains, and aches, but they also say, hey, you having a bad day? You're having a tough time? You got a little anxiety? We got pills for you. And the issue is very important here is because the whole aspect of medical research is based on the drive by the drug company. It's the drug company that profits from the research because then when we understand how things work, they make the parts and then you buy the parts. Except sometimes there's a lot of errors in that. And I'll give you a big one that's affecting the population right now. There was a study done in North Carolina and it revealed that more than 50% of the children taking Ritalin for attention deficit disorder don't have attention deficit disorder. I mean, in other words, we're over-prescribing the drugs. And the problem is it's not the drugs that are the answers to the issues and that we have to look for another answer. So we get out from this drug model. So I have to explain to you how cells work. And this is a beautiful part because it's not very complex. The complexity comes in the number of pieces. And the pieces that I'm going to talk about are the proteins, that you have approximately 100,000 protein parts that make up your body. And these are just like machine parts. And the reality is that these 100,000 parts work together and carry out the life functions. They don't look like the machines that we're used to. They have weird looking shapes to them. They look organic. Of course they're organic parts. They're amorphic looking. They don't look like sheet metal and screws and nuts and bolts. They look like things like this. Now, at the top of the picture in white is, a, is an AIDS virus. At the bottom of the picture in white is the surface of a human cell that the blue structure is a protein attached to the AIDS virus and the red structure is a protein that's on the surface of every one of your cells. And the idea is the virus cannot attach to your cells unless the blue protein of the virus complements and plugs in like a lock and key to the red protein on your cell. Now when you look at this little bubbly looking protein, you might think, well that's just this little organic chewing gum kind of thing or something, but the truth is this. These are as accurate as machine parts as any human machines we've ever made. That the fact is that this same red protein is the very same on every one of your cells because if it wasn't, you wouldn't be able to be affected by the AIDS virus. So my point is for you to recognize that machines don't always look like the machines that we see, but they have an organic look to them. This is another organic machine. There you can see a helix, the orange, I mean the yellow and the magenta is a DNA double helix. But in purple and blue and green and orange, that's a protein machine. Again, you look at it and you say, well, that's a machine? And the answer is yes. It actually screws down the length of the DNA, and at the front where the arrow is, it, that, that protein machine adds new pieces to the DNA to extend the length of the DNA. So my point again is, look at this, but recognize these organic things are actually machines. So here's a picture of a protein on the left and a picture of the protein on the right. It's the same protein. And the point about it is this. Underneath the structure of a protein is a backbone. The backbone gives the shape to the protein. Remember when we were young and you went into school and your teacher said, draw a person. What, what kind of person did you actually draw? A stick figure, right? With the backbone and the shape, that's what gave the shape. And then when you got older, you fleshed out the stick figure. Well, the point about it is this. The protein on the right is the stick figure, and the one on the left is the fleshed out version of the same thing. So there, underneath, there are these uh, backbones. So here's the, the interesting fact. There are 100,000 different proteins, and all proteins are the same in this regard. All proteins are like beaded strings. The beads are amino acids, so when you go to the health food store and you hear about amino acids, what are they? They're the building blocks of the beads. There are 20 different kinds of amino acids that make up the beads. So what is different between 100,000 different proteins? And the answer is this. The length of the chain 
and the sequence of the beads. The sequence of the beads give the shape. Well, you say, well, where can you get some shape out of this? Looks like spaghetti. There's no shape in this. And the answer is, well, the beads actually have a little bit more rigid structure. So what I'm going to use are these pipe fittings that are going to represent three different kinds of amino acids just by the colors. So instead of 20, I'm only going to show you three. And what they look like are actually, if you look at the backbone there, they actually look like these pipe fittings. And the reality is this. The amino acids plug in together like that. And when they plug in together, you can start to assemble them. And actually, it's still a chain, isn't it? If you think about it, it's just a sequence. But now, instead of being flexible, now you begin to see that there's a very specific shape that's occurring here when I start to assemble them. So as I start to assemble my protein, all of a sudden, you see the backbone starts to acquire a three-dimensional shape. So do you see the three-dimensional shape? Say, yeah. yeah. I thought you'd see it. And the reality is this. If you see it, compare it to the, to the shape back there. You see the, the similarity and the colors? And the fact is this, that the protein backbone are these amino acids. And if I change the sequence that I put this together with, I won't get the same structure. So the point is this, each protein is different because each protein has a pattern that is determined by the sequence of the subunits that are making them all come together so that a protein has that particular structure to it. It's just like a backbone like in you. Your shape is determined by your backbone. And so the fact is this, where you have vertebral bones, the protein has these amino acid subunits. And the reality is this, but you also can change your shape as you bend and twist your backbone, then the truth is proteins do the same thing. Proteins are like miniature people in that regard. So instead of looking at a machine like this, the metal machine that we're used to, imagine if I replace the gears with proteins. Okay, now we have a protein watch. But the bottom line is this, let's get rid of all the metal. And now you're saying, what? Well, what is this, a collection of proteins? It's not a collection. to do what? Digestion, respiration, muscle contraction, all these are machine-like elements. In fact, I could take the proteins out of your body, put them in a test tube, and carry out the same functions. I can do digestion in a test tube. I can do muscle contraction in a test tube. The point is this, your body cells are made out of these inter interesting protein parts. And now let me just talk about the fact is that, remember I showed you there's a backbone version like on the left side of the screen, and then there's a fleshed out version on the right side, it's the same protein. The yellow is an antigen, like a virus. The blue is a protein called an antibody. What I want you to notice is, you see how the shape of the protein and the antigen are complementary? What happens if I would come up here and take out that yellow antigen? What would be left on the surface of the protein? A pocket, a cleft. What would fit back into that shape? The same thing that I pulled out of it. In other words, the shape I'll give you one more example of that. Here's an enzyme in blue. And then there's a chemical group that plugs in. It's so specific that protein surfaces have pockets and clefts, and other things plug into them. Like, and let me give you an example of this. And let me show you, actually, this is the interesting part. Let me show you where life comes from. You can see it right in this little model. It's going to work like this. First thing before I do this, I'm going to say this. The two amino acids in yellow, let's say they're negatively charged, OK? You know what like charges repel each other and opposite charges attract? Are you familiar with that? So the question is this. I'm going to show you two shapes. And then you tell me which is stable. Shape one is this one. See the shape? OK, shape two is this one. Which is more stable, one or two? Two, because the opposite, the, these like charges preferred shape of the protein. Why? Because the two uh, light charges are as far apart as they can. Now a direction of protein is an interaction. It's like gears. That these protein machines actually start to work together. A chemical or a hormone comes into the environment just like that antigen in the antibody and it plugs in. And happen when this comes by? It's going to attract it. Now it binds it, right? Now the question is this. What charge is, is this more stable or is this one more stable? Okay, so what did you just, now just think of the logic, what you just said. You showed me two different shapes for the same protein, right? And what's the difference? What's, gonna, what's the protein going to do? It's going to go back to this one, right? This is movement, right? 
Did it go from one to two? Did it move? Movement is a source of life. Why does it have two shapes? Because if I take away the charge, let's say I take away this drug, what charge is at the end of this chain, positive or negative? What charge is at the end of this one? Now the question is life. It's just the only molecules that move. Proteins move. Life comes from moving proteins. When I make the protein as it moves do work, then behavior comes from the movement of protein. Provide for the structure of the body, but then the proteins are capable of changing their shape. Changing shape. This is right out of the science journal, so it's not my pipe fittings. This is the molecular model that's in the journal. And you can see the protein in green on the left is, this is the protein that causes muscles to contract. It's a switch. It's like an on-off switch. In the green form, the muscles don't contract. But when I add a signal, which is that white dot, it's calcium. When the calcium plugs into the molecule, it's exactly the same as the signal plugging into my protein. It changes the electrical charge. And when the charge changes on the protein, it changes its shape. So I go from conformation to one to conformation two. But what if I take the signal away? Well, when I take the signal away, as you saw, the protein will reset back into the original conformation. So the point is this. A protein exists, and it will not move until what happens? What is the event that causes the protein to move? The signal. So the signal, when it shows up, causes the protein to make work. So the fact is the body coordinates the functions of the system by controlling the signals to the proteins, which then control their movement. And that movement is generated into functional things like breathing and digesting and moving and excreting waste matter. It's all through these functions of the proteins. The shape is called conformation changing. As illustrated right here on this picture, there's a protein. So the conclusion is simple. Proteins change shape, that results in movement, and the movement is harnessed by the cell to do work and behavior. So that proteins give you your, not only your physical structure, proteins also provide for your function. So when you look in the mirror and you look at your identity and your character, you're really looking at the proteins that are giving you the shape. But you also recognize this, that you can change your shape and you can change your movement because proteins also move and change their shape so that the bottom line of life comes from protein movement. That's the truth. If you stop protein movement, life stops right at that point. And it's, proteins are the only molecules that are moving, so they become the most important ones in the generation of life. So if I have a test tube on the left side, I put all the proteins of the cell, and I have a cell on the right side with all the proteins in it, so the, the proteins are exactly the same in the left and right. The test tube is not alive, but the cell is alive. And yet it has the same protein. So the question now is, what, what is the difference between the two? And the answer is simply this. The cell has control. The test tube, all the proteins are just working randomly. There's no order, no organization, no orientation. They're just making a gamish. And they're all moving around, but they don't lead to a direction of life. To have life, I have to control the protein's functions. Then I have, I have control. And the question is, so what controls life? Now here's an assumption, and this is where it all went wrong. It goes like this. Protein parts are like parts in a car. When you drive your car, after a while, the parts wear out. Let's say you're driving along, and, you're, and you're, your tire wears out, and it goes flat. What happens to your driving then? It stops. OK, if you want it to start again, what must you do first? Replace the tire. OK, here's the point. Proteins wear out. In fact, every day you're, you're losing cells and proteins by trillions of cells and tons of proteins are getting lost because you're using them. So we have to replace the proteins. So the scientists sat back and they said, what's the simplest way to control biology? And the answer is this. If I have a function and the proteins are making the function and a protein in that function wears out, what happens to the function? Okay, if I want to have that function again, what must I do? Replace the protein. So the scientists sat back and said, well, that's the simplest and easiest way to control biology. If we can find what replaces the protein, then we will find what controls the cell. So the bottom line is they started off already with an idea that was first grounded in the science in 1859 by Charles Darwin because he said this. He said that the traits and characters and behavior of an individual are due to hereditary factors. 
We didn't know back in 1859 what those hereditary factors are. But by 1953, this is what we found. They were looking for the hereditary factor because they said the hereditary factor controls the protein. So the belief is this, that the pattern of the protein, the beads, you know, the colors of the beads that I'm showing you here, are built into the patterns of the subunits on the DNA helix, those little things, the rungs of the ladder. And that these DNA codes for this. And the relevance of why DNA would be the hereditary material is because DNA doesn't wear out. DNA doesn't break down. In fact, you can find fossils, like 50,000-year-old fossils, and take DNA out of the fossils and put them in a test tube and make proteins using the DNA as a blueprint, make proteins from an animal that died 50,000 years ago. The point is, the DNA is stable. There are no proteins left from that animal, but the DNA is left behind. So the point is, DNA becomes a hereditary material because DNA has the ability to be stable and not, not wear itself out, and that's what allows it to be the hereditary material. So the conclusion of science, and this is a conventional view as we're speaking right here. This is what's being taught in schools, and everyone hears the story. It's called the primacy of DNA. And what does it mean? It says, I told you, you are protein. You're protein. Where does your protein come from? Ah, well, it comes from the DNA because that's the blueprint. And the DNA makes a Xerox copy of itself, which is called RNA, and the Xerox copy goes into the cell, and the blueprint, the RNA blueprint, is read and converted into the protein. So the bottom line is this. Here's a simple understanding. If your character is in your protein, where'd your protein come from? It came from the DNA. So therefore, your character is apparently determined by the DNA. So our belief in the primacy of DNA says this. Who you are, what you are, is predetermined in the blueprint, the DNA. So you become a readout of the DNA. So when you read articles like this in Life magazine that says, were you born this way? Now we start to recognize not only is our physical structure apparently determined by our DNA, but so is our behavior, aggression, anxiety, happiness, alcoholism, obesity. All these kinds of things are now attributed to what? Some pattern that you have received. So if you start to feel ill at some point, and then they start to say, well, yeah, that, you know, you have genes that are affecting you in this. And so the point about it is ultimately what is the belief system? The belief system is if I can understand all the genes and then I could replace any broken genes that you have and I could replace your health. It's a nice, noble concept and led to the Human Genome Project. But the conclusion of this is what? This paper just occurred, this was only uh, back in uh, May in science, it's a mainstream journal, and it's about the nucleus, the cell, and the nucleus is a, an organelle inside the cell where the DNA is. And I bring this up because it, it, it says exactly what the conventional point of view is. It says the nucleus is the command center of the cell. What does it mean, command center of the cell? Well, what we were looking for was the brain of the cell. As I said, every cell has all the same functions that you have. Well, you have organs to carry out your functions. Inside a cell, there are miniature organs, and they're called organelles. And I said, since you have all of your functions are in a cell, then a cell has a nervous system. The nervous system is the command center. The uh, nervous system is now going to be the nucleus of the cell, that dark red structure. For what reason? Because conventional biology said that the nucleus is the command center of the cell. So what does that mean? Well, that's where all the genes are. All the genes are in the nucleus, and since the genes control who you are, then the nucleus, as a repository of all the genes, would represent the source of control. And therefore, it leads us to the conclusion that the equivalent of the brain is the nucleus. Does that so far make any sense of what I'm talking about? Okay, now listen to this. This is where it all falls apart. Listen to the simple logic question. If I take the brain out of any living organism, there's an immediate and necessary consequence of that action. What is it? Death. And here's the point. You can take the nucleus out of the cell, and the cell doesn't die. The cell can live for two or more months without any genes in it at all. It's not sitting there. It's moving around. It's eating. It's growing. It's meeting other cells and communicating with them. It recognizes toxins and avoids toxins. In other words, I did not change the behavior in one way, not so ever, by taking out all the genes. What does that mean? Think of the logic of what, what does the logic mean? Can the genes control, can be the brain of the cell, yes or no? 
Ah, well, that's the important part, because this is understanding of enucleation, the process of removing the nucleus, is, is done a lot at higher levels of biology, and those people who do it obviously know that genes aren't controlling the cell, but somewhere along the line, all of you have heard through all the news media, of course, the genes control the cell. So the bottom line is, assumption number two, genes control biological expression is false. But then that leaves us with the important question. If the genes aren't controlling the cell, what is controlling the cell? And this is where my research led me about in 1985 to understand the relationship that genes have with the cell. And the important part is this. In the literature, especially in mass media, these two words get confused all the time, correlation and causation. Correlation means associated with some, there's a connection between things. Genes are correlated with your body, that's a fact. Causation is the act or agency that produces an effect. Genes do not cause anything, that's the error. But the problem is this, you read an article, and this is a true story. An article that reveals, for example, that they found a gene correlated with obesity. And then, here's what was interesting about it. They went to a, a number of expected parents who were expecting a child, and they said, listen, if we would do amniocentesis and check the cells of your fetus and found that your fetus had this gene associated with obesity, what would you do? 70% of the parents said they would immediately opt for an abortion. And the relevance about that is, I never said the genes caused obesity, they're correlated with obesity. The fact is, if you read the articles, they always start out, a new gene is correlated with cancer. And then about a paragraph down the road, this gene causes cancer. This is an error. Genes do not cause anything. Genes are potential. Whether you activate the genes or not is not at the behest of the gene. So what is it that selects the genes? And the answer is, well, we start off with the, the, the first part about this is, what are the genes, what activates the genes? Because if I knew what activated the genes, then I'd be right at the edge of what's controlling the genes. I use this paper because there's a, a sentence I use straight out of the paper, so I'm not trying to pull any wool over your eyes. This paper, Metaphors in the Role of Genes in Development, explains this. Metaphors means, in this case of science, when a scientist wants to do an experiment, he creates a hypothesis. This is an idea. The experiment is to test the idea. The hypothesis is not a truth, it's just a suggestion. In 1953, when Watson and Crick found the secret of the DNA code, the hypothesis was made that genes control biology. But that was in 1953. That was 50 years ago. And the issue was this. If you keep repeating that over and over again, at some point, you forget that it was a hypothesis. At some point, it becomes a truth. And so we buy the truth that it's in major textbooks everywhere. Genes control. Genes control. And the answer is, do genes control? This paper reveals in this sentence by Niehaut the truth. When a gene product is needed, a signal from its environment, not an emergent property of the gene itself, activates expression of that gene. Well, the third line, not an emergent property of the gene itself, means this. Genes are blueprints. A blueprint is not on or off. A blueprint is just data. Can, if you had a blueprint to a house, does, is there an on and off to your blueprint? No. The blueprint doesn't go on and off, but what goes on and off is who's reading the blueprint. And the point is, genes are blueprints, but they don't determine if they're going to be read or not. And when it says, what makes it read? And the answer is a signal from its environment. Well, let me explain exactly how genes work. This is a picture of a nucleus of a cell that's isolated. That's where all the chromosomes are. Then there's a broken nucleus from the same preparation, and you can see all the chromosomes are lined up out there. And you can see, for example, the two red ones. And the point about it is this. You get two sets of chromosomes, one from your mother that comes with the egg, and one set of chromosomes from your father that comes with the sperm. So you actually have two complete sets of programs to make a human being in every cell in your body. And the issue about why I'm showing you this slide is because it's new interesting technique for staining the chromosomes. And the fact is, what am I staining? Well, the belief system is the nucleus contains the DNA, which it does. But here's the point. I'm not staining DNA. I'm staining protein. 50% of the nucleus is protein. But we don't talk about the protein. Why not? Because we're so focused on the DNA. When they do the experiments, what do they do? They break open the nucleus like this. They isolate the chromosomes. Then they throw away the proteins and study the pure DNA. But the truth is, 
there is no such thing as pure DNA in a human system. What does it look like in the system? And the answer looks like this. What are the proteins actually looking like? And, and right here, what you can see is this. The proteins are covering the outside of the DNA like a sleeve. These proteins are given a name of regulatory proteins, a great name because that's their function. How do they work? And it's so simple, it works like this. Imagine my arm as DNA. Well, let's imagine my bare arm as DNA. And I write a genetic code. Let's say I write the code for blue eyes on my arm, the genes that make the, the code for blue eyes. And I say, okay, what does this DNA look like when I put it back in the nucleus? And the answer is it looks like this. Can you read the genes or not? What do you have to do to read the genes? Say it. Take the sleeve off. Then you can read the gene because the code is written on the arm. So what's the sleeve? The sleeve is the protein. Well, how does a protein come on and off? And the answer is this. Here's a protein that is covering my DNA, and I change the signal by removing a signal or adding a signal. And what does a protein do? Change its shape, and when it changes its shape, it pulls away from the DNA. And the moment it pulls away from the DNA, I have bare DNA. Now I can read it. So the question is this. In order to read the genes of the cell, then what I have to do is affect the protein. So let's look at the flow chart now. Here's the current version of the flow chart. Remember before it was DNA, RNA, and protein, the conventional one that's in all the textbooks? And the answer is, well, that's incorrect. It's totally incorrect. For the answer is, the DNA is covered by regulatory proteins. And to, to get the regulatory proteins off, the sleeve off so I can read the gene, I need an environmental signal. So the bottom line is this. You're not controlled by DNA. You're controlled by environmental signals. And this is what Niehaut writes in his paper. Just reading the yellow lines is the answer. You are not controlled by genes before it's a signal from its environment that activates the expression of the gene. So all of a sudden it says, wait a minute, then I'm not, I'm not genetically determined? No, you're environmentally determined. And all of a sudden, so what's, you know, we have to talk about how does that happen? Let me explain the mechanism. First of all, what is the environment? Well, the environment, there are two environments that affect all of us. There's an internal environment under your skin, the environment of your physiology, your blood composition, the temperature of your body, the amount of sugar in your body, the amount of nutrients available, the information. This is the environment on the inside. Yet, what is the other environment? The environment on the outside controls us. Why? Because when we live in that environment, we have to adjust ourselves to what's ever happening. And to adjust ourselves, then we change our genes to adjust to the environmental signals because the environmental signals elicit the gene action. So the question is, so where's the brain of the cell? And the answer is, the brain of the cell is the membrane. It is the skin of the cell. What about our belief that the, the brain of the cell was the nucleus? And the answer is this. Science is a male-dominated profession. And since males think with this, they made the brain of the cell. But the bottom line, I'll tell you what the nucleus is. The nucleus is the gonad of the cell. Why? What is the function of the nucleus? To make the programs and blueprints to replace the parts. So when I need new parts, I go to the gonad to give me reproduction. So the nucleus is for reproduction, it's not for brain. The brain of the cell is the membrane, and I don't have a lot of time to go into exactly why, but you have to understand that the membrane is the most primitive structure in biology. The most primitive organisms have just a single membrane. They don't have anything else in that, and that all their functions come from the membrane. So if we understand the membrane, we can then understand how it works. So let me illustrate, for example, how it works. Here are cells on the surface of a culture dish, and if I look at the membrane and I cut into the surface of the cell, this is what we see. That the surface of the cell looks like this layered structure right here that separates the outside environment from the inside environment. The yellow in the middle is like oil, and as a result, the membrane is a barrier that separates the outside from the inside because water can't go through the middle of the membrane and carry information across. So the self on the inside, under the membrane, is separated from the environment on the outside. But this wouldn't do any functions. This is just protection. To do function, I need the protein that does movement. Proteins do the movement. Proteins do the function. So like I showed you in my poppet bead version of the proteins, that these poppet beads insert themselves into that membrane structure that I showed you. And so the proteins stick inside the membrane. There are two classes of proteins in the membrane. They're very important. One set is called receptors. What's a receptor? Do you have receptors? Of course you do. What Name some. Skin? What, name some other ones that people are pretty obvious about. 
Eyes, ears, nose, taste, touch. Where are all the receptors located? In your skin. And the same with the cell. But in the cell, they're not organized into these structures that we see, but the proteins have antennas on them. And each different thing the cell can see has a different protein with a different antenna. So for insulin, I have a receptor that sees insulin. For glucose, I have a receptor that sees glucose. For light, I have a receptor that responds to photons of light. So for everything the cell can see, there's a special receptor inside the cell. And then the receptor is for what? Taking signals in. That's what receptors do. I see through my receptors. But now when the signals come in, I have to make a behavior to respond to the signal. So that's the other set of proteins. The example that I'm going to use from the other set is called a channel. A channel means a canal. And the point about it is, in the resting state, the channel is closed. Nothing can go through the channel. But in an activated state, the channel opens up and there's a tunnel that goes from one side of the membrane to the other. Let me explain how they work. This is an example of the, uh, of the receptor. Let's explain how it works. The receptor sits in the membrane, has an antenna sticking up, and look at the bottom. Watch what happens when a signal comes in. The signal, remember, the environmental signals cause a confirmation change. So look at the shape. So if I'm inside the cell, I know if the signal is there because I can look at it. But when the signal goes away, then the confirmation goes back. So remember, I showed you this. Confirmation one, confirmation two. What was the difference between one and two? the signal. So when a signal comes in, the antenna receptor changes its structure. Now the other proteins, the channel looks like this. When we <clears throat> look at the channels inside the membrane, they too float around inside the membrane, but a channel is different because a channel is closed. And uh, we said the channel works when it opens up. So when a signal comes in, it opens up, and then information or molecules can shoot down the tunnel, down into the cell. And it can only do it when it opens and closes. But look, the wrong size signals don't go in, so the channels regulate which things can get in by opening and closing. So what we looked at is this. We saw signals come into antennas and change the structure of the receptor, and we saw that the output device, in this case a channel, can open or close when the signal comes in. Now let's put them together and see what, they, what happens when they come together. And the answer is this. The antenna on the left is going to scan the environment. Notice the shape of the protein inside the cell. It's a smooth tube. This is a connector called the G protein. Look at its shape. Can it plug onto that? Yes or no? No, look at the shape. It won't fit. So that when no signal is there, that connector doesn't connect. But when a signal shows in, it changes the shape, connects this one to this one, changes this one, and this makes a signal. So I have an environmental signal coming in the antenna, and then the channel on the right converts that signal into behavior. Do you understand? It's a switch. So let's, just do, let's see if I can do this one again. If I can uh, show it to you again, um, it works like this. Again, watch this. This is what controls biology. Antennas receive the signal from the environment, and when a signal is received, it changes the shape of the protein and allows the connecting device to connect the receptor to the output. The output is the channel. The channel creates a signal that enters into the cell, and that signal that now is going to go enter into the cell activates the functions of the cell. It causes the cell to move. It causes the cell to digest things. It causes the cell to change its uh, structure or behavior. So the fact is what? This is a, a signaling device. This is the actual device that controls the behavior of the cell. So how does it work? Well, the receptor picks up a stimulus, right? Say, say yeah or no, so we go like, yeah. OK, yeah. And, and then the output goes through the channel, because the channel is closed. And when the signal comes, the channel opens. And then the signal goes down and activates the functions of the cell. So the stimulus is received by the receptor. And the response is produced by the channel or the effector. So when I put that together, what does it mean? It says this. It says stimulus response, that biology is stimulus response, that the inputs, the signals from the environment, are collected by the receptors, and the receptors read the environment, whether they're reading the external environment or the internal environment. But once they receive a signal, I get a response. That's the output. Behavior is a response. So the output is mediated by effectors, such as the channel. So the bottom line is this. Environmental signals elicit behavior. Got it? If I, get, if I remove the environmental signals, what behavior do I have? None. And this is an interesting point. As I said, I could take the nucleus out of the cell. I don't change the behavior at all. But if I go to the cell and cut off the antennas, the cell has no behavior. Now just think for a second. Stop and just think for the profound meaning of what this says. 
then the behavior you're expressing is what? A reflection of the signals that come from the environment. So all of a sudden, your behavior is not coming from the inside as much as it's totally a reflection of what you see on the outside. And so that this is changing your life is through this. But this device is what controls the cell. That there are thousands and thousands of these input and output devices controlling the cell. Now, is it, is it clear at least that how this acts as a switch? Say yes or no so I know what we're doing okay. Well, if now you recognize that each one of these things can activate a function of the cell. Now, this is the beautiful part because I'm going to let you say the words. Is it true or not that the receptor represents awareness of the environment? Okay. Is it true or not that when the channels or whatever the output devices are start to create a physical response, that they create a physical sensation in the cell? Okay, so is this what controls the cell, or at least a function within the cell, yes or no? What is this called? And the answer is, in the dictionary, there is a word for this. And the word is perception. Awareness of the environment through physical sensation. And basically, so you just saw the labeling of what? A device that controls the cell. What is this device that controls the cell known as perception? So are you controlled by genes? No, you're controlled by perception. Perception is how you read the environment and adjust your behavior. It makes sense because if your behavior is linked to the environment, then you're in, coordinated with the environment. If your behavior is not connected to, the, to what's going on in the environment, you're out of sync. And that actually is neurological problems in many cases when your behavior doesn't fit the environment. So the point about it is this, cells started to come together into community. And why this was relevant is each cell is reading what it should do by reading the environment. But when cells start to come together in a community to make a multicellular organism like you or myself, then something has to happen. What's different about the individual versus a community and it's this, if I'm just a free living cell, I can walk around and do anything I want and it doesn't make any difference. But if I join a community, then the word community has meaning. It means communication. It means holding it together. That my, as an individual cell in the community, I can't do what I want to do. I have to do what the community agrees. That's part of the deal. If I give up my independence, I give it up to join the community. But the reason for joining the community is my, I've got greater chance of survival with more members all working together. That's what community is all about. That's why, community, why people came together to form communities instead of living alone, because community brings greater life. But when I look at that, then here's the important understanding. If a cell doesn't listen to the community's voice, then the cell is not part of the community. Cancer cells have withdrawn from the community. They're still in there, but they're not listening to the voice of the community. They're doing their own thing. Why would some cells get out of the community? And the answer is, why, do people, why are people homeless? Why are people out of work or why are people separating? If the community is not supporting them at some point, the cells recognize, my God, what do I want to be in this for? So there's a point that cancer starts to recognize as a result of breakdown of community. Well, let's look at cells moving in community. This is a uh, movement of a bunch of cells, and I'm going to show you the communication using a special dye. I can show you how the cells are communicating in this community. There's a dye that you can see the nervous connection of cells. Now, in this one, the dye lights up. It's a fluorescent dye. Now, you see the sparkling and flashing? That's the neurological process of each individual cell. But watch what happens. Waves of information start. Why? Because the cells are connected to each other. So the actions of some cells are spreading to other cells. So what you're actually looking at, it's sort of like an uh, electroencephalograph of cells. You're watching cells talking to each other because cells work together in a community. When the community falls apart, that's when disease starts to happen because that means that they're not, for some whatever reason, they're not being supported and, that's, and that will then uh, lead to the end of the community. So the point about it is this. Each cell has a brain. That's a fact. Each cell can read the environment and adjust its function for whatever it sees. But when cells get in a community, they defer their own belief system or their own system of what they're seeing to the central command. So as you can see here, I have a cell here on the right-hand side, uh, marked in purple over here, that this cell is out here in the environment. But what should its function be? Well, the answer is it's going to be coordinated by the brain because the brain is going to tell all the cells what we should do to work together to you know, provide for the success of my living organism. So the brain gets in between the environment and the cell. The cell no longer reads its own environment. The cell depends on the central nervous system to tell us about the environment. So the bottom line is this. The cell on the right is intelligent. 
It will always be able to adjust itself to the environment. That's when I was taking cells out of sick people and putting them in culture, they started to get better because when left alone, they could say, man, I could live comfortably alone without being in that system anymore. <clears throat> and then, so the fact is, so what regulates a cell now? When it's in a community, the cell reads the environment, which is the left side, uh, but it doesn't read it directly. It now reads the environment through the brain, and the brain interprets the environment and then tells the cell what adjustment it should do to live in the environment that is seen. And the issue is, in general cases, this wouldn't be any big deal. But the issue deals with what about our perceptions? Because perception is controlling the cell, not the genes. Well, let's ask some simple questions about perceptions. So you can take a test here, because it's a perception test. And the perception test works like this. Very simple question. Is A, the surface area of A, greater than, equal to, or less than the surface area of B? What's your answer? Less. less. Cool. But that's so easy. Everybody can figure this guy out because they're nice little square boxes. But what if they're not so square? What if they're irregular shapes? So let's take a look at it this way. OK, th you take this test. I'm going to ask four questions. And then I'm going to go over the answers. And the questions are basically the same in each one. Is the one country greater than, equal to, or less than the other? E equal to means approximate, OK? So the point is this. From your perception, and they get easier because I don't want you know, everybody to get all the answers wrong because you'll go home disgruntled. So I make them easier as we go along. The first one, is South America greater than, equal to, or less than Europe in surface area? OK, hold that. Another tough one, not as tough, but is Scandinavia greater than, equal to, or less than India? Make a decision on that. And if you have trouble with that, let's make an easier one. Alaska and Mexico. And if you really got trouble and you got real vision error, is the north greater than or equal to or less than the south? You got those down? OK, so now let's look at the answers. The answer is South America is twice as large as Europe. You got that right? You got it right, good. OK. Um, let's talk about Scandinavia and India. India is three times larger than Scandinavia. Did you get that one right? Oh, okay. Okay. And uh, lastly, the north and the south. Maybe the easier ones. Let's go to the easier ones. Um, Mexico and Alaska, they're about the same size. The South is twice as large as the North. OK, everybody got 100? Yeah. Well, what's the point about this? And the point about it is what? This is your perception. What's it based on? The map. And so the reality is this. Let's look at the map. The map was made by Germans. So where do you think the dead center of the map is? <laughs> and what's the equator represent? What's the equator represent? It's the midpoint between the north and the south. But on the maps that we have studied ever since we were kids, where's the equator? It's 2 thirds down the bottom of the map. So if I adjust the equator and bring it back into the proper order, then this is the map that you will see, because this is the map that was put out by the United Nations. And the relevance of this map is what? It's not the world as you thought it was, right? And it basically, remember that third world, that little place someplace else? The third world is twice as large as the first world. And our perceptions have been off. Our perceptions which make us act in response to our perception, if we would use this map, if your life was dependent upon getting 100 on this exam, there would be a lot of dead people in this room at some point. <laughs> so the point is what? The point is perception is what gets between the environment and the cells. But what do we know about perception now? What do we just know? We just heard it. Perceptions may not be right. So rather than calling perception of the environment, beliefs. It's your belief about the environment that adjusts your physiology. And your beliefs become then most important because your beliefs are connected to your genes. And that the expression that you have is related to what you have going on in your head. Think about it. Maybe perhaps think about a time when you were really sick and you said, oh, God, I can't get up. And then somebody said, look, you've got to come to work right now. You've got to do something. You had to change your belief. What happened? 
You changed your belief, you got up, you got dressed, and you did the job just fine until you were able to go home and say, God, I think I can sit down and be sick now again. <laughs> and so the issue is this, that the point is the truth. Perception selects genes, but perceptions may not always be right. And therefore, perceptions, by definition, are called beliefs. And therefore, when I put that back into the equation, you're not controlled by genes, you're controlled by belief. And why that also comes to an important point is this. These women dance because their passion in life is to dance. They have no other belief except for the fact that they know they're going to dance. Age is not relevant to these women. Aging is a belief. And the problem with this belief about aging is that it will kill you. The belief of aging will kill you for this reason. As soon as you start to tell yourself in your perception that you can't do something anymore, then your biological system will adjust to prove you right. You will not do what you think you can't do. And the issue that you know has to do with use and disuse. And aging is one of the serious problems of disuse. When we tell people, okay, you're too old, stop doing this. People say, okay, I'm going to retire. I, my father worked six and a half days a week. He retired and he died within a year. Why? And most people in some level are involved with sickness and illness after they retire. Why? Because what are you telling your body? What's your belief? You are finished. When we stop doing things, the body will start to resorb the structures. Things like osteoporosis. Why do so many people have osteoporosis at that age, that older age? Well, how many of those people, for the greatest exercise, turn the television on and off? <laughs> if you sit down and you do not exercise, then the system will take itself apart. You don't have to be old for this to occur. I get to have a 10-year-old kid with a broken arm, and when I put a cast on that kid's arm, and I come back six weeks later and take the cast off and compare the muscles, there's going to be half the amount of muscle in the arm. And the bone density is going to be greatly reduced, showing osteoporosis, if that was what your assessment was. And the bottom line is the kid doesn't have osteoporosis. What's the function? He's not using it. And just recently, it has been repeated several times now, the primary cause or contributing factor of Alzheimer's, lack of use of the brain. That when people separate, and as they get older, stop communicating, this is one of the main contributors to dementia. The fact that when you stop using your brain and start turning it off because I'm finished, the brain, just like the muscles in the arm, will start to remove the cells because the intelligence of the system is so superb, it says efficiency is the basis of life. We don't, as humans, we, we don't know nothing about efficiency. I'll tell you that right now. Cells do. Cells know that if a structure is not being used, they will not support it. And the relevance about it is this. The vitality of these women is the vitality of their belief system, the fact that they know they're not finished and that, that keeps them alive and it keeps them young. And there are people out here in the audience that know there are some people out here that are working past their retirement age and they're healthier and happier for the process. So again, the end of this first part, this is the understanding. You are machines made out of proteins. The proteins move in response to the signals. The signals are controlled by the membrane, which reads the signals and then adjusts the body by sending signals to the body to respond to the environment. That the environmental signals are perceptions by definition. You saw it. Awareness of the environment through physical sensation is perception. But then, as we also saw, perception may not be accurate. And when a perception is not accurate, then it's really a belief more than a perception. And the bottom line is this. The conclusion is that beliefs run the genes. And we know this in many cases, especially people that have terminal cancer. The only ones that can really get out of that pronouncement of death are the people who do what? Change their entire belief system and say, I'm not buying that story. I'm out of here. I'm going out to live my life. And when they do, they take control of their life. And guess what? They start to manifest a remission and more health through the process. So the bottom line is, the truth is you are not genetically controlled, but you're controlled by your perceptions. Now, when I extend this in the next half, what I'm going to extend on and talk about is simply this. 
The signals that are in the environment are not just physical signals as materialistic Newtonian biologists believe. That energy is equally valuable in eliciting biological systems, and I'll demonstrate that, as well as, as molecules. I will also start to talk about the role of parents in conscious parenting because the belief of the parents is now recognized to select the genes in the fetus. That if you were a parent or you were once a baby, then that would be very important to you for the following reason. It reveals that we were, the life that we express today was very, very much shaped by the belief of our parents. And I'll talk about that, and then the most important part, how belief can rewrite your genes, and I will show you the science of that when we come back from the short break. Thank you very much.